So one of my favorite things about large language models is they give us explanations. What I want to do today is dive into how we can use these explanations. Now for background, I've spent a lot of time thinking about evaluation of large language models, going through many different methods. If you want this larger, bigger picture, check out my YouTube video that I have on it. It goes into a lot of depth. Today, what really what I want to focus on is can we use a large language model to explain its own predictions? Outside of large language models, for example, for tabular data, we have techniques like SHAP that we can use that help give us explanations of the predictions that are going on. Now, when we move over to large language models, we don't have these tools like SHAP. It's just a lot harder to understand how these transformers are working. There's tools out there. There's mechanic, mechanical interpretability people. But at this point, really, we don't have an easy way to just dive inside a transformer, a large language model to understand how they're working. But here's the thing. We know explanations are really useful, whether you're trying to improve or diagnose the model, whether you want to explain your predictions to a stakeholder, or you're just thinking about trust regulation, proving it to a larger audience that your model is robust. Three things we're going to cover. Ways we can use explanations, the usefulness of explanations, and then what are the methods? How can we get these explanations out? The explanations we get out of these models can be really good, sometimes better, as this study showed, even better than the ground truth that somebody was given. The explanations can also be used to improve the predictive performance of models. So this is one where they added the explanations around with some examples for doing tasks in Big Bench, which is a widely used benchmark for doing that. And they were able to improve the performance by adding these explanations in there. We've also seen this in the context of RAG. And you can see as the graph shows you here is when we added explanations in, we ended up with better performance. Now, the reality is, is I kind of cherry picked these results, but I just want to get on your radar that sometimes adding these explanations can really be helpful. Now, explanations do require compute resources. You don't get them for free. So something to consider as we're going through this. So how useful are explanations? I know from my own experience in doing things like text classification, having the explanations gives you a whole useful understanding of exactly what the model is doing. It can actually help me rethink why the model is doing something in a particular way. We've also seen research that shows that they're very useful for recommendation tasks as well. And we have anecdotes. I've talked to lots of people like Jason where they've used these explanations and they found great success in using them. The explanations aren't a silver bullet. In cases where the examples are really hard for the model to work with, the explanations aren't as reliable. And in fact, if you go all the way to the extreme of giving the model a little bit of kind of biased examples, well, the explanations can also fall apart too. So don't think of the explanations as always going to be perfect. It depends on how well the model understands how well it's doing those prediction tasks. Now, if the explanations are all over, one of the things we can do is add some more consistency to the explanations. So this is some recent research on doing on adding fine tuning step to get better explanations out of the model. The third thing is getting these explanations. And if you look at some of these examples, you might think it's pretty easy to get an explanation, right? You just ask the model, hey, what's the prediction for this? Can you explain this um, as well? But you could also do it the other way. You could ask the model to explain itself and then get the prediction. And this is where some research has dug into this and compared both methods. And it's not really clear. Like if you look at these results and stare at them hard, maybe it's better to do explain first then predict later. But it's not clear across the across the studies I've seen from my own personal research. And this is why often a lot of people will just try both approaches. And what's happening is, is it really depends on the complexity of the task. Sometimes it's useful to ask the model to think through things. And in that case, having it think through things before it gives the explanation might make a little bit of sense. So let's wrap this up. I covered a number of points that I wanted to, and here's some takeaways for you if you're thinking about using explanations. I think having a larger model that has richer knowledge is going to give you more useful explanations. This counters a lot towards the folks that are often focused on using smaller models. I think if you want explanations and you want good ones, 
a larger model, in my experience, is going to do better. Second is prompting. Prompting has a lot of variation. Being able to play around with different approaches to prompting is going to be necessary to get the best explanations out there. I've seen a lot of different methods, things like adding nearest neighbors, few shot approaches, for example, that end up with much better results. Same thing with explanations. So think about spending time on that prompt engineering. And then set reasonable expectations here. If your model is trained in one domain, don't expect it when you're asking questions outside of that domain to get good explanations as well. So I think this is where where I've seen the explanations go way go awry is often when you're asking the model a little bit too much more than it can. Now, finally, let me know what you find. I think this is an interesting and fascinating area, still really underdeveloped at this point.